So welcome back. This is a video for chapter 12, which is entitled Significance Tests in Practice. In chapter 11, we talked a lot about the theory of significance, hypothesis tests and significant tests. Um, and now we're going to look at a little more kind of practical, very quickly about how to use them. Ch chapter 11 was much more kind of theoretical, and this is a little bit more practical. Um, in class, I'm going to lump chapters 12 and 11 into one big test all about hypothesis tests. So we'll have a combined chapter 11 and 12 tests. Section 12.1 is all about tests for a population mean, which is basically kind of naming that test. It's a t-test for one population mean, or you could call it a one-sample t-test, or you could call it just a plain old t-test. One of the things we're going to look at um, from now on is we're going to try to name the procedure we're doing. So any of these things in light blue would be valid names for the procedure we're doing. We're just basically doing a t-test um, for an unknown mu. So let's look at a concrete example. So here's a concrete example. It's a little small, but I'll read it to you. It says, a credit card company has found that account holders use their cards an average of 8.4 times per month. To increase usage, the company conducted a promotion in which account holders could win prizes by using their card. During the promotion, an SRS of 28 account holders used their card an average of 9.7 times. The sample standard deviation was 2.6. And notice that's what makes it a t-test instead of a z-test. This number right here, this 2.6, is an is an S, it's not a sigma. It's the standard deviation of the sample, not the population, so therefore we use T. Do these results provide evidence at the 1% level that the card usage increased during the promotional period? So this number right here, this 1%, that's the alpha value. What they're saying is normally we use a threshold for unusual for, that is 5%. For some particular reason, the people asking this problem want you to consider the threshold to be 1% for this one. So when we get our p-value at the very end, we're going to compare it not to 5% like normal, but to 1%. Uh, so here we name our uh, unknown parameter, and mu is the population mean of all number of times a card is used per month during the promotion. That's an unknown mu. Our null hypothesis, we think mu is 8.4. Kind of in words, that would mean the promotion makes no difference. You don't need to write it in words, but I think it's kind of helpful to kind of frame what you're talking about. I wouldn't mark off for this, nor would the AP, but it's really, it's, sometimes it helps you in a complicated question to kind of think about that way. Our alternative hypothesis, mu is greater than 8.4. Why was it a greater than? Because we think that this promotion makes people use their cards more, right? Increased up here. And that's kind of what I wrote here. And then I just named the procedure. It's a one-sample t-test is one of many, many ways to say that. Oh, that's weird. This uh, graphic is in the wrong place. Oh, well. Let's see if I can move it. Maybe I can't. All right, anyways. Um, so checking our conditions, uh, it's an SRS. I wrote this in red because our, I do have some concerns about the T distribution being appropriate. Our sample size is only 28. It's, that's not 30 or 40. Um, and we don't really have the data, so we have no way of making a box plot. And you know, it might be plausible that the um, distribution of people using their credit card, times people use their credit card per month is somewhat skewed, right? You probably have a lot of people using it a lot and a lot of people using it you know, um, rarely. So I kind of wrote here, um, I do have some concerns about the T distribution being appropriate, but I'll just continue because I don't want to kind of risk not going on. But I do have some concerns here. Uh, since there are more than 10 times 28 users, we'll assume that people who use their credit card are independent of each other. Okay? Kind of typical checking your conditions. I don't know why this graphic's in the wrong place. It should, trust me, I put it up at the top when I prepared ahead of time. So now we do our calculations. So we have, here's our T formula. And again, it's T and because we have S here. Compare this to chapter 11 where this was a sigma and this was a Z. This is X bar. This is what we think mu is. This is S over the square root of 28. We get a T score of 2.64. Kind of like a Z score, but using the T distribution. Notice I wrote for this T distribution the degrees of freedom is 28 minus 1 is 27. That helps me kind of frame exactly what this curve looks like. Here's a t-score of 2.64. I shade it over here, and I get a p-value of less than 1%. And now notice this is, we're going to get into this unlikely because it was less than 1%. Oh, good. The, the graphic's back up here now. Um, so then here's our last paragraph, exactly like what we wrote before. There's about a less than 1% chance of getting an x-bar of 9.7 or more due to random chance if mu is actually 8.4 exactly like what we were doing in chapter 11. Since this is unlikely, and here unlikely means less than 1%, not less than 5%, we will reject the null hypothesis. There is evidence at the 1% level 
that people use their card more during the promotion. And what I'm trying to do here is the last sentence. I try to write it in English, not symbolically. I kind of said symbolically what that is. But think about if you were writing a big paper, this, is, this last sentence is kind of your conclusion of you know, what the experiment was all about. So imagine someone flipping to the very, very last line of your paper to see things. They're going to want to read English. They're not going to want to read some symbolic stuff like that. Okay, very, very technical problem. We did that a little bit in Chapter 11, although we tended to do more Z-tests than T-tests back then because we were just learning. But very, very same inference toolbox, same thing. Okay, I want to just talk about um, a couple, two more ideas related to this in the section 2.1, 12.1, excuse me. And the first idea is there's a relationship between confidence intervals that we did way back in Chapter 10 and two-sided tests, two-sided meaning not equals. So this was actually a problem. It was problem four on the Chapter 10 practice test. This was a problem not even in Chapter 11 when we were in doing hypothesis tests, but before that when we were doing confidence intervals. So you may remember it. It talked about wheat pennies, uh, where these kind of, here they, here's what one looks like. Uh, pennies before they put uh, the Lincoln Memorial on the back. Here's the weight of wheat, some wheat pennies in grams. And the question says construct, and I changed it a little bit, a 95% confidence interval for the weight of wheat pennies. Okay? So let's look at, again, this was back from Chapter 10, and you'll see where I'm going in about one slide. So here I kind of do the whole, remember this was our confidence interval formula. Yes, you should actually do the conditions. It's exactly the same as we just talked about. It's exactly what we did in Chapter 10. So let's kind of not worry about that right now because I want to get to why I'm suddenly talking about confidence intervals. So here we go. Here's the whole process. I put all these numbers in L1. I did the T interval and I got, here's my interval. Notice the X bar was uh, about 3.03 .03 for these numbers and standard deviation of the sample was about this. So back in Chapter 10, we learned to write, I am 95% confident that the population mean weight of wheat pennies is between 3.013 and 3.059. That would have been a problem in Chapter 10, minus the fact that I didn't check the conditions. Now, why are we talking about this? What, what does this have to do with hypothesis testing? Well, imagine there was a Part B to this question that said something more in hypothesis test language. Is there evidence that the mean weight of pennies is not 3 grams? So here you would do your null and alternative hypothesis, and you might think, well, this, shoot, does that mean I have to do the whole inference toolbox all over again? And the answer is no. This is the key idea. There's a relationship between this interval, which we found using a confidence interval formula, and what if you wanted to do a hypothesis test with a not equal to? Well, how confident are we that mu is actually in this range? We're 95% confident you'll notice that 3 is not in this range. Therefore, aren't we 95% confident that mu is not 3, right? 3 is not in this range, so we're 95% confident that mu is a number that is not 3. So if you were to do a hypothesis test, you'd, and if I give you an interval and then ask you, well, what would you do if you were doing a hypothesis test, you don't even need to do the formula. You should be able to rash logically figure out what would what decision would you make here. And the answer is here you would actually reject the null hypothesis. Okay? Yes, yeah, since 3 is not in the interval, you're 95% confident that mu is whatever this is wrong. I wrote the wrong thing here. Oh my gosh. Disaster. Disaster. I'm 95% confident that mu is a number in the interval. That mu is in the. Oh, I say what I wrote. I actually didn't write it. I, my English is bad. I'm 95% confident that mu is some number in the interval. So therefore, I'm 95% confident that mu is some number different than 3. So therefore, you would reject the null hypothesis. So the relationship between confidence intervals and hypothesis tests is if the number is in your null hypothesis is in the interval then you would fail to reject, because there's a chance then that mu actually is still 3. But in this case, the number is not in the interval, so you would reject the null hypothesis. That's kind of the check. Is the number in the interval or not determines whether you should reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, this, there's one other kind of question I want to talk about here, and it has to do, it's the same formula, but the problem definition looks a little bit different. So same formula. And we're going to look at something called a t-test for matched pairs. Now, matched pairs is I'm bringing back a term 
from way back in chapter 5 when we were talking about experimental design. Remember that a matched pairs design is something like you use every, every subject gets the treatment twice. We did sometimes like right hand, left hand. Remember we talked about an example of the front tire of a bike and the back tire of a bike. We talked about like, you know, punting a ball twice, once with helium, once without. So anytime you have you kind of read a problem, you recognize that something's being done. Every treatment is getting each, sorry, every subject is getting each treatment twice. That's a matched pairs design, and this is an example of that. Okay, basically they want to test um, your reflexes, so they basically have you try to catch a falling meter stick, both in your dominant, right for right-handed, left for left-handed people, and then your non-dominant hand, and then you can. Check. You can, this is in like this is in milliseconds. How long it took you to catch the meter stick from the moment it dropped, and then you're you're claiming that the, you're faster with your dominant hand than with your non-dominant hand. Okay, why is this a match pairs design? Because each of these numbers represent one person. You know, for example, these numbers right here was the same person. It took 189 milliseconds with the right hand, 184 milliseconds with the left hand. Each of these is one person, okay? So if you recognize something's a matched pairs design, you do one little thing a little bit differently, but otherwise it's exactly the same as we've done before, okay? Mu is the population mean difference, and that's kind of a key word. In reaction time, I wrote dominant hand minus non-dominant hand. Here, there's no number anywhere up here in the problem, but we kind of think about what does this problem mean? The context, the problem solving is important here. We think that mu is zero. Well, what... Where'd the zero come from? Well, zero came from the fact that if they're actually, if it didn't matter, if you were equally good with your dominant hand and your right dominant hand, and your, your dominant hand and your non-dominant hand, wouldn't the difference be zero? In other words, if these numbers, the average would average out to zero for each person. Okay? So you, very often for a match pair sign, you have to kind of come up with this idea of zero on your own. And then our, null hypothesis, our alternative hypothesis, we think the dominant is less, so we say mu is less than zero. And now we write, I'm doing a t-test for, t for match pairs. Okay, I'm going to trust that you can check the conditions. They're exactly as they were before. But notice down here, I want to show you actually the process I did on the calculator, because I did something a little bit clever. I put all the dominant hands in L1. I put all the non-dominant hands in L2. And then what I did is I made L3 L1 minus L2. I did that because that's the differences. What I care about is really not the numbers in L1 and not the numbers in L2, but I really care about the numbers in L3, which are the differences for each person. That's super duper important. Now I can do a t-test. It's a plain old t-test like we did before. Now I have data. Look, my null hypothesis is mu equals zero. And the list I'm using is L3, because that's the differences over here. And I think that mu is less than zero. So these kind of two, this and this kind of show you how you do a t-test for match pairs. And then I do the whole process. I hit calculate. I get a t-score of 2.776, a p-value less than 1%. And it actually calculates x-bar and s for L3. So the x-bar of the differences is negative 13.16, and the standard deviation of the differences is 16. This is not the x-bar of L1, it's not the x-bar of L2, it's the x-bar of L3, it's the x-bar of the differences. And then just like before, I graph it all over here, I get a t-score of negative 2.77, p-value less than 1%. Okay, and then we just uh, sum it up with our step 4 of the inference toolbox, the paragraph. There is a 0.9% chance of getting an x-bar of negative 13.16 or less due to random variation if mu is actually zero. Since this is really, really unlikely, not that unlikely, but unlikely, we will reject the null hypothesis. There is evidence that the dominant hand is faster, or another way of saying there is evidence that mu is less than zero. Exactly what we've done before, just the one little difference is you had to use that little trick with L3. And that really wraps up sectional 12.1.